chapter one. We also um, got a metric system lab, and um, now I think you're going to get in the routine where you can work with your lab partners and send in one lab for your whole group, contact each other, make sure you can reach each other so that everybody does their part to uh, finish the labs. because you, you all are going to need each other. And also I emailed you and uh, you should have uh, you should pick up the mineral boxes that I've prepared for you. They're at my house in front of my front door but underneath the mailbox, 115 Dixie Lane, Oak Ridge. Come over and pick those up. Uh, I'll need those back later on, but for now, uh, those are going to be used to you for the next lab that I'll send you some information about next day or two. But uh, I wanted to get you started on plate tectonics. So, this is chapter two in your textbook. Early, oh, I, I think you already know some about it. We talked a little bit about Alfred Wegener. We talked about Harry Hess and Robert Dietz. And we talked about Tuzo Wilson. Um, the story begins like this. Back in the 1600s, and, um, various countries started to explore coastlines. Portugal, China, Britain, France, um, Japan, um, some countries in Africa, and they started to map coastlines. And we started to get a map of the world. So by the 1700s, we had a map of the world. And people noticed that the continents fit together like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. They've noticed that. School children noticed that going back to the 1700s. I get my face here up front here and to float. Okay. Anyway, since the 1700s, they started to notice that. Um, but no one really made sense of it until this man, Alfred Wegener, came up with his hypothesis of continental drift. There he is, Herr Wegener, in 1912. And. Uh, Herr Wegner put it like this. I was in Berlin at the Alfred Wegener Museum and um, I had to listen to the recording three or four times because my German's not great. Ich verstehe ein bisschen Deutsch. My, my, my Deutsch is nicht gut. Verstehen Sie? Anyway, so I had to listen to it and I listened to it. And basically what Wegener said was um, the reason why a best analogy for why the continents fit together like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle is because uh, you can imagine. No, actually, it says he probably said it like this: "The reason why is the continents they fit together like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. It is like a newspaper, yeah. Well, you have to a torn up newspaper. If you put the torn pieces of a newspaper together, and the lines of print run smoothly across." You can only assume that the paper was once together, yeah? Not funny. Okay, anyway. That, that's So he basically said the continents must have been together and then they drifted apart. That's the only logical explanation. I think uh, Herr uh, Wegner is right about that. But Wegner outlined four lines of evidence to support his theory of continental drift. And I'm going to write them out for you to make it easier. On, if you're, I'm hoping you're taking notes on this. The first reason why, his first line of evidence to support his new theory of continental drift was matching continents. We talked about that already. Second line of evidence he used was matching rock types or geological features, if you prefer, or geological features. Third line of evidence he had was matching fossils. Fourth line of evidence he had was paleoclimatic evidence. Paleo means ancient, so ancient climate evidence. Those, ladies and gentlemen, are the four lines of evidence that 
Alfred Wegener outlined in his paper that he published in 1912. It was published in, published in German first, then it was translated into Francais, French, and then Spanish and into English, and then to all the different languages of the world, where geologists were um, amazed by this, because what Wegener sa said contradicted what people thought uh, of at the time. Before Wegener, people used to believe in something called permanism. Permanism means that the continents have always been in the position that they are today. North America hasn't moved at all. Eurasia hasn't moved. Africa hasn't moved. South America, they stay in the same position. All of the Earth's geological features are stable. That's called permanism. But what Wegener was doing was really overturning the apple cart. He's saying that no, it's not permanent is, is not right. The continents move. And here's the four lines of evidence that he gave. Matching continents, I already talked about that. Let me talk a little bit about matching rock types here. And Okay, when you think of rocks, sedimentary rocks, which is what Wegener was looking at, rocks represent depositional environments. What does that mean, depositional environments? It means a rock forms from sediment, which is deposited in different locations around our planet on the surface. For example, you could have a river as a depositional environment. A river might carry cobbles or sand, and that's deposited at the mouth of the river and that makes sedimentary rocks or sediment can accumulate from um, for, uh, for, uh, on the bottom of a lake mud can, will collect on the bottom of the lake eventually that mud will become shale a sedimentary rock called shale s-h-a-l-e s-h-a-l-e or limestone will form, form from the bodies of little creatures living in the ocean called plankton and that makes limestone Bottom line is, when you look at sedimentary rocks, you always want to think about the depositional environment. Depositional environment. Where did that rock form? Did it form in a lake? In the deep ocean? In the shallow ocean? Where did that rock form? Okay, so, um, having said that, let's look at some examples of matching rock types. Um, notice here that Africa and South America fit together quite well. And th these deposits here in uh, Central Africa were formed in a, um, a lake. And then we find those same exact lake deposits in South America. That does not make sense. Think about it, ladies and gentlemen. If you, why would you have a lake thousands of miles away across the Atlantic Ocean forming in this part of South America the exact same characteristics as those here in Africa? It, it doesn't make sense if you believe in permanism. But if you put the continents together, it's one big lake. Okay, let me give you an example that's closer to home. Um... I'm guessing most of you all, I, I, I haven't met you in person. I wish I could have met you in person. I don't like doing this quarantine teaching, but I guess we don't have a choice. So, I, uh, And while this is loading, it's really slow loading here. Um, let me see if I get a picture here faster. Okay. Let's, holy mother of God. Okay. So... Um, uh, I'm, if you were sitting in front of me, all 15 of you, I would ask you, where are you from? And you're, you're probably going to tell me Tennessee or Kentucky. Uh, I happen to be from New Jersey. But um, I've lived here in Tennessee for a long time, and so uh, I guess te I, I consider Tennessee home. Anyway, we've got these beautiful Appalachian Mountains here in Tennessee, and they go all the way north to Canada. 
And that's what I love about Tennessee, is the beauty of these mountains. Guess what, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, have you ever been to the UK, Great Britain? Well, here's England. Uh, I, I took a train ride from London to Scotland, up here. And um, I fell asleep on the train, and I looked out the window, and I thought I was in Tennessee. Why? Because those mountains there are exactly the same as the Appalachians. The same rocks that are there in Ireland and England and Scotland. How can that be? Think about depositional environments. And those same rocks are also there in Norway. Well, if you put the continents together, see if I can get a picture up here. This It's a little bit slow, but uh, if I can get a picture here, then it'll make absolute sense. Let's see. Okay, so here you got the, the Appalachian Mountains going all the way from the, um, Georgia up to Nova Scotia. British Isles, same rocks, same mountains, same exact rocks, same as in Norway. Why? Why? That doesn't make sense. If you, if you believe in permanentism, you'd have to say mount, a mountain range formed here, here, and here thousands of miles away. And uh, that means the same geological forces were acting in these three disparate locations. It doesn't make any sense. Put the continents together, like Alfred Wegener said. You have one long mountain range. Bottom line is, the Appalachians are the, uh, are the southern part of the mountain range. The, the, the southern Appalachians. The British Isles are the middle Appalachians. And the Caledonians up here in Norway are the northern part of the Appalachians. It's, it was one mountain range. 245 million years ago. It was one mountain range. So this mountain range only makes sense if you put the continents together. Just as Wegener said. So matching rocks clearly show that the continents were once together. Don't, don't forget this word, Pangaea. P-A-N-G-A-E-A. -A -A. Here's Wegener's original picture here. Look how the continents fit together perfectly. They were once together, ladies and gentlemen. They were together 245 million years ago, and they have drifted apart since. Matching rocks, the jigsaw puzzle fit of the continents. Third line of evidence that Alfred Wegener used was matching fossils. For those of you who took historical geology, you know that fossils are evidence of past life. Usually they're the bodies of creatures that have died a long time ago, or plants that have died a long time ago. Here's Ve Rather than show you modern examples, I'd rather show you Wegener's original example. There's your matching continents. Look here. Okay. See these four fossils here? Um, these fossils are from creatures that lived 245 million years ago when Pangaea was together. We have Mosasaurus, Cynonathus, Lysosaurus, and Glossopterus. Okay, let's just take a look at Cynonathus. Cynonathus was a 6 to 10 foot long reptile. It was a quadruped. It walked on four legs, a herbivore. It plodded. It couldn't walk more than two or three miles an hour. It was not a good swimmer. We find it in Central Africa and in South America. If you believe in permanentism, you have to explain that. It's almost humorous reading those textbooks that were written before um, Alfred Wegener's idea, and even after, because Wegener's idea wasn't accepted until 1967. So if you look at textbooks in the 50s, uh, people still believed in permanentism, and they'd have to explain how you had Sinonathus in these two locations separated by thousands of miles of South Atlantic Ocean. 
and they have these pictures. They're, it's real funny of a male standing on that is grabbing onto a log and drifting across the South Atlantic Ocean for thousands of miles. And then later on, a female would um, drift across the ocean uh, on another piece of debris, and they would meet, and they would start a new colony. It doesn't make any sense. If But look, when you put the continents together, it makes absolute sense. That male Sinonethus did not, that female Sinonethus did not drift apart uh, across the ocean and meet that male. She walked over five inch, five foot away and he was there because this is, the, this is the geographical range. It matches up. The same with these other, uh, with the plants. Look at Glossopterus. Glossopterus is a fern plant. If you believe in permanism, then you'd have to explain how these fern spores got blown through the wind thousands of miles from um, Australia into Antarctica into Africa into South America. Doesn't make any sense. But you put the continents together and, because they fit perfectly together. Then look, the the Glossopterus, the range where you find these fossils matches up smoothly across the continents. So fossil evidence, matching fossils, matching rocks, the jigsaw fit of the continents. Fourth line of evidence that Wegener used was paleo, ancient, climatic evidence. Let's take a look at the ancient climatic evidence. Um... We could look at glaciers, for example. Glaciers, I don't know if you, most of you all grew up in Tennessee and and um, Kentucky. You probably, it, it, you might have seen them if you went to northern Canada. Let me show you what they look like. If you go to northern Canada, the, the landscape is covered with ice, sometimes tens or hundreds of feet thick. And they're there during the summer, too. The ice is still there during the summer. It, it retreats a little bit because it gets warmer, but it still covers the land. So glaciers leave behind sedimentary rocks. Uh, a glacial depositional environment leaves certain types of sedimentary rocks that we find over and over again that Canadians are so familiar with and Alaskans are as well. The ice moves sediment, and it dumps out sediments of all different si particle sizes, from boulders, big boulders, to cobbles. Cobbles are about the size, a couple inches, about like a baseball, um, to a gravel, size of gravel in an aquarium, to s smaller than that sand, smaller than that silt, smaller than that clay. So all of these different particle sizes are dumped out. And mixed together and um, when the ice dumps out the sediment. Well, glacial till tells us th that glaciers were once covering a part of the world. We can find glacial till here in southeastern South America, uh, Central Africa, South Africa, India, Antarctica, and Southern Australia. If you believe in permanentism, you'd have to explain Glaciers forming at the equator. That doesn't make any sense. Um, growing up in New Jersey, I met a lot of people of Indian ancestry. And they would tell me it's it's um, way too warm They have to have ice in India. Or Africa. That's impossible. There's rainforest there. But put the continents together and lo and behold, it makes sense. All the continents were located near the South Pole 245 million years ago. If you ask me, those four lines of evidence are pretty convincing. And so Wegener's ideas were um, revolutionary. They overturned the old idea of permanism. Having said that, scientists are a very conservative bunch. They don't just jump aboard and accept a new idea. They demand more and more proof. 
imagine that you're one of those scientists who you, your whole life you've been teaching permanism in the classroom. You've been talking to your students about permanism. And now somebody comes around and tells you everything that you've learned is wrong. You're not just going to accept that, are you? So the next video, we, we'll talk about um, why people opposed Wegener's idea. Most people did not accept it. And then how the evidence that was gathered during World War One, the between World War One and World War Two, going up the, to the 1960s, led to the development of plate tectonics. So I'm going to call it quits here and make another video for you tomorrow. Good night.